and I'd like to say welcome to everybody this evening. It's great to see you and for our first um, 2022 online forum series. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Orsi Dunn, who is a lecturer in the Ayrshire area, with us this evening to talk about what I think is a really important and actually really timely um, subject. Because we have had some issues with links, I'm going to not talk too much about anything else and pass you straight over to Orsi with my thanks. Orsi. Okay, um, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. I really appreciate the fact that you're here on a January evening. Um, I know it's not easy. Um, so I'm going to start um, straight away if that's okay, because I won't struggle, struggle for time. Okay, yeah, right, here we go. So um, we'll start with a rather existential question, okay? Um, I'd like to know why <laughs> we are here, um, namely, um, what, what, why are you interested in attending uh, this session on trauma tonight? So you can, you can tell me or you can pop it in the chat box, um, just so that we have um, an idea of um, who is here and, and and why, for what reason? Okay. Okay, so Alison teaches refugees um, and she'd like to know more about trauma. Um, and we have Sue who would like to recognize the signs of trauma, okay. Okay, and Callum works with lots of people, lots of refugees who have um, experienced trauma. Okay. So I can see that uh, most people um, work, in fact, all of us here uh, work with uh, students who are affected by trauma. Okay. So I, I, would, I would like to um, start with uh, a bit of background, okay, um, and uh, just take you through uh, why we need to talk about trauma in our classrooms. Hmm. Okay. Right, so we'll start with the um, Scottish Health Survey. This is from 2019. Um, and uh, this is the general population of Scotland. Okay, 71% of Scottish adults reported having at least one adverse childhood experience. Um, um, so we would define adverse childhood experiences as stressful or traumatic experiences that occurred during childhood. So that's zero to um, 18 years. And that can be, you know, that can range from being a victim of abuse and neglect um, or, uh, you know, growing up in a household where adults experienced um, harmful drug or um, alcohol abuse, um, domestic violence, mental health issues, or, you know, maybe a prison sentence. Um, another important bit of statistics for us is that one in seven adults in Scotland um, have reported to have more than four cases. Okay. In terms of um, the, uh, the kind of um, students that we have, um, I think uh, we can safely say that there has been a significant rise uh, in the number of students from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds in ESOL classrooms. And uh, if you look at the, the numbers here, you know, 61% of asylum seekers suffer serious mental distress and refugees are five times more likely to have mental health needs than um, the UK population. This um, shows a, a significant scale of need and um, you will know that um, you know trauma um, it can be related to pre-migration experiences or during affect people during migration or indeed um, it can be linked to post-migration yeah so separation from family from family difficulties with asylum procedures um, poor housing and so on um, so there is a substantial scale of need. Um, we'll start with the definition of trauma. Um, so trauma can be defined as an event, series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. Um, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, 
emotional or spiritual well-being. Okay. Um, this is one of many definitions of trauma. Um, at this stage, I'd like to highlight that I am not a doctor, okay, not a psychologist, not you know, don't have don't have a, a degree in counseling. Um, so we're going to look at trauma today from an educational point of view. We're going to talk about trauma as teachers, as educators. Um, trauma is, of course, just a word of warning. Trauma is experienced differently by everybody. So um, there are an infinite number of variables um, and not everything I say today will be applicable to um, every trauma affected um, student. Okay, so when I use the language of possibility, that this can happen, this might happen, these things tend to happen, I really mean it. It's not, whatever I say is not true to all learners. Okay, so trauma and the brain, one thing that we can be sure of is that trauma changes the brain. Okay, this is what all research points to. Um, trauma impacted brains um, can be in a constant state of stress and individuals can become hypervigilant. And this means that they will be constantly assessing potential dangers um, around them, threats around them. This of course will affect their cognitive functions. So we mean concentration, memory, yeah, learning, information processing in general. Um, and trauma affected individuals can have fear alarm reactions, which um, are marked, you know, psychological, physiological, and behavioral changes. So the hypervigilant brain focuses on survival and discards all non-critical information. Yes, so um, basically the brain has evolved to protect us and therefore it reacts to trauma-related triggers in order to prepare for the future, okay? So, it is no surprise, of course, that trauma has a significant impact on um, students in a classroom um, and, and on um, educators in the classroom. Um, and the educational impact is huge. So we can you know, um, talk about it in terms of lower assessment scores or low motivation, higher dropout rates. And a substantial amount of research has gone into this and um, everything points towards the fact that um, um, trauma um, and education um, are very much, uh, educational attainment are very much um, linked. Um, students' brains in the classroom react to trauma-related um, triggers, and this can make learning of any kind, any kind of new information being processed, a really challenging thing. Um, so I'll continue with a question. Um, I'd like to ask you, in, in your experience, what kind of behavior can we see when, when students um, are triggered? What, you know, when, when, when students um, have a, a, a trauma-related response, what, how does their behavior change in your experience? What happens? And you can just say it, you know, <laughs> talk to me. Poor, poor processing skills. Uh-huh. Yeah, difficulty focusing. Yeah, Hannah says, uh -huh, lack of concentration. And in terms of behavior, what do they do? What can they do? What might they do? Mm -hmm. Short-term memory problems is um, Hannah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people, sorry, is it okay? Yeah, 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 go on. Okay. So um, yeah, in my experience, sometimes people express frustration uh -huh. um, and, sort of anger with themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes, yeah, like Callum's just put, they, they say, we're tired. And they, yeah. they'll kind of, um, so there's like, the, there's like the, the frustration response and then the kind of tired, uh, sort of zoning out response that yeah. I've seen. Oh, yes, this can be, I mean, yeah, we're, we're talking about a spectrum, we're talking about a scale of behavioural changes and reactions, yes, so um, they, um, as, as you say, um, you know, students can become quite passive, tired, you know, exhausted, quiet, yeah, but on the other end of the scale, they can get frustrated and irritable and angry with themselves, with you, with other learners, yeah, 
So this can all happen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, one aspect of, um, oh yeah, you can't, you can't see this very well. I apologize. <laughs> my Google Chrome has decided to change all my slides. Okay, this is not my intended color scheme, by the way. This is not my ethics, <laughs> okay? Something just happened and I had no time to change it. But just bear with me, just humor me, okay? So um, basically trauma affected students um, tend to have a reduced ability to self-regulate. And uh, basically when you're in a state of alarm, um, and you have a reduced ability to self-regulate, you will have negative behaviors and you will focus more on non-verbal cues. You can't quite hear and can't quite process information. You don't hear what I'm saying to you as a teacher. Mm -hmm. All you're focusing on is my facial expressions, yeah, my gestures, my position, my posture, my positioning in the room in relation to you. Um, so basically all of this, both for the student and for the, for the lecturer or teacher, can be a massive ground for misinterpretation, okay? We can misinterpret the student and of course the student can misinterpret us. Because if we're taken by surprise, a reaction to the student's trauma response is, you know, something that they can misinterpret. Um, and then of course there's a potential for for escalation there. And um, basically some researchers just say that, that the students, trauma affected students don't have the adequate neurological structures to deal with challenging situations. Okay. So just a little uh -huh, um, slide to sum up, you know, um, we have inadequate strategies that bring about misapplied survival skills. Um, and we can often, you know, they can often deal with negative emotions by turning to the language of aggression or avoidance or conflict. Yeah, they can become too quiet or too loud or, you know, a, a, a range of behaviors that the teacher then can misinterpret. And then it will escalate in some way. And, and again, the, this escalation can take, you know, many different forms. It can be punishment or it could be re-traumatization, and we'll talk about how that can happen, or it can be disengagement. You know, the, 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 the student will just stop coming to class. Okay. So, and I, I would like to talk about the psychology, um, the psychological aspect of trauma just a little bit. Um, it, it often happens that um, trauma-impacted students will have a really heavy focus on the negative, yeah? And they will ruminate on negative experiences. They, they, they can have a really, really poor self-concept. And, you know, this means low self-esteem, low confidence. Um, they, can, they can have all or nothing thinking. So thinking in the extremes, like, um, if this worksheet is not perfect, I'm a failure. If I don't understand every word in this exercise, then I'm absolutely rubbish. And there's no point in starting or there's no point in doing it. There's no point in me being here. Yeah, so they can, they can really, this is all or, all or nothing thinking. Um, they will or might do mental filtering when, when you only pay attention to one certain bit of evidence and not other things, yeah. Um, so obviously they would be considering the negative aspects and discarding the positive aspects of what they're being told or what they see. And then self-labeling. You know, I'm stupid, I'm slow, I'm, I'm terrible at this. Okay, and another important aspect of um, student experience, trauma-affected students experience in the classroom is fear. And I mean, it's really unfair on our teachers, yeah, because even at the best of times, <laughs> our students are terrified. <laughs> um, but the trauma affected student will be especially um, affected by fear. Um, this can be a major contributor to their experience. And um, a trauma impacted person will or might be experiencing perpetual vi vigilance, yeah? And this can give way to this kind of low simmering fear that is always there, 
this is exhausting. Yeah, this alert, this high alert that your surroundings are always laced with dangers. And so therefore they can have really deep seated fear of the teacher, maybe because um, the teacher is in a position of authority, you're an authority figure and they've had really negative experiences linked to authority figures or figures of authority. Um, and then of course, new learning, and this is like that for all of us, you know, new learning can be a really confrontational experience. So imagine a course that you have just started, you know, if you're doing anything, you know, rehas, whatever, you know, when, it, when you're confronted with the amount of stuff that you need to do and the new environment and a new teacher who does things in a different way, it's really massively con confrontational, even for an experienced learner like yourselves. Yeah. So um, this, the, the, the discomfort of new learning can be particularly challenging for a trauma affected person. Um, and of course, then can it can develop into this into distrust, yeah, and suspicion of the of the teacher. So, what can we do? Uh, you quite rightly ask. Um, basically, small changes can make a really big difference, and um, we really need to look at the understanding of um, our you know, of, of, of ourselves, first and foremost, so have self-awareness, and then look at our understanding of the learners in terms of behaviours, yeah, um, and um, we need to have an awareness of um, the actions and behaviours and topics that can trigger a trauma response, um, and, and that is a, you know, that is a, 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 con a continuous kind of journey, yeah, it's a constant state of becoming, because once you think that you have figured out one person, you'll have a new person arriving. And then once you, you know, there are so many different things that we need to work out in order to create a, a safe environment for everybody. But basically a prerequisite of learning is a, a kind of attentive calm. And this is what we're going to have to um, um, aspire to in our classrooms, because if people are anxious, if people are uncomfortable, they're not able to learn. Okay. So, what are these small changes that we can do, um, or changes that we can make? Um, basically, um, trauma intensifies the need for control. Yeah, trauma impacted people are looking for control because they've lost control. So choice is a really important aspect of their learning. Um, they need a great degree of choice, a greater degree of choice. And um, um, basically by giving them a degree of choice um, ensures that um, you can avoid a power struggle. So for example, you can always incorporate choice by saying, what would you like to start with? Do you want to start with A or do you want to start with B? Do you want to do this activity um, orally or would you prefer writing it down? Do you want to work on your own or do you want to work in pairs? Yeah. So even if the activity is a challenge, even if the activity is frightening, introducing an element of choice will really, really kind of smooth and, and kind of lower the, the, the impact um, of, of, of what they're um, facing. Um, you can embed your you can embed choice in your directions, yeah, so that you don't sound like a dreaded authority figure. For example, if they're not allowed to eat in the classroom, you don't need to say, you might not want to say no eating in the classroom. You can just say, well, actually, I'm sorry, you know, it's 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 not allowed. But where would you like to eat? Would you like to eat in the cafe or would you like to eat outside, you know, um, in the corridor on the uh, on the seats? Um, and of course, there's topics that we need to be really careful with. Um, there are certain topics that they're comfortable with and certain topics that they will definitely wish to avoid. Um, and this stage, I'd like to ask you, because you're all experienced practitioners, in your experience, what topics do you think we best avoid with trauma-impacted students? Talking about war. Civil mm -hmm. unrest, uh -huh. conflict. Conflict, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, and possibly possibly getting into human rights so anything that might go towards torture yeah. or imprisonment mm -hmm. you know so and and any visuals that that might um may allow the person to become re-traumatized by going back into that personal experience yes yes mm -hmm. we have to be really careful so the news got to be really careful if we're using current events you know ESL teachers we quite often use new the news in our classrooms news headlines recordings of the news newspapers etc but we can either directly or inadvertently even bringing a newspaper in they might see a picture that reminds them back to the war in Syria or Iraq or whatever their particular trauma is yes yeah yes yeah, family, Seuss's family can be really difficult. I, I completely agree. Yes, uh -huh. traditional family structures can evoke particularly painful memories. Yeah, and, and, and our books are full of those, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yes, homes. Uh -huh. Yeah, even, even asking people uh, um, to describe their home, because that might bring back all the loss. Yes, yes, or remind them of the differences of what they've yes. lost, what they've lost and what they have now. Yes, yeah, and how far removed they are from yeah, where they would like to be. Absolutely. Okay. Sometimes um talking about jobs as well, is it sort of a similar mm -hmm. um a similar thing to homes? It yeah. can um yeah, remind people of how different their lives are here and um be a bit difficult to yeah. Uh, yeah. to talk about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really unfair in a way, you know, I mean, there are so many topics that can trigger these responses and, and, and there are so many different individual lives with, you know, individual experiences that we have no way of knowing. Um, so, um, yes, let's get back to um, small things again that we can maybe change um, and create a safer environment. Um, establishing routines and predictability is a, a, a fantastic um, um, aid that you can use in your in your teaching um, because structure provides a sense of safety yeah and uh, if there is a change it's best to inform the students and explain the reason for the change um, so that again they they, they have control um, also uh, developing an understanding of the key signals in the learner's behavior, you know, um, just by observation. And, and of course, that means that we need to get, that, get to know our students quite well um, so that we're able to predict, predict when they need that break, yeah, when they need to be away from the activity. Um, so frequent breaks, you know, learning in smaller chunks um, can be really useful. And of course, planning, planning sequentially structured and scaffolded activities. Yeah, so hopefully what you're hearing now is, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm, I'm in fact already doing all of that, you know, and, and, and that, that is a wonderful thing. Yeah, so um, I, in my experience, we're always just a bit more trauma aware than we think, you know. Um, but one word about... Um, being trauma aware and um, we as teachers uh, we need to be expecting the unexpected yeah and, and look at our uh, students reactions in context um, so basically if you want to understand trauma reactions um, one way to do that is by um, thinking of a student as a fizzy drink can yeah it's a it's a um, um, Jessica Minahan that um, wrote about this really rather beautifully in a series of articles. Um, so what she says that if, if you think of a student as a fizzy drink, uh, well, she says soda drink because she's American, uh, or a soda can, uh, basically you don't know how every shake, yeah, is a, a potential event that can, that can trigger a trauma response, but you don't know how many times that drink has been shaken. You have no idea. You can't see inside the can, 
you don't know what's happened before. You don't know what happened an hour ago or this morning. You don't know how many shakes the can has had. So something really rather innocent that we do or something that happens can have a massive, massive impact, a massive explosion. If we're able to think of the student as, you know, okay, this is a big reaction and okay, I did something, but it might be just a really, really small shake, but the, the person has had loads of shakes before, we can, be my, we, we can be a lot more forgiving, both with ourselves and with the student, yeah? So putting it into context will, will really help everybody. Um, and of course, we'll need to try and minimize the number of triggers that they have in the class. Okay, and that's the job basically, to minimize the number of times that um, the, the can is shaken. So what can we do once we do have um, you know, an explosion? Um, what are the things that we can, we can do? Um, basically, we need a paradigm shift yeah, of, uh, of, of, of how we view the student's negative behavior. So we need to see it in context to avoid misinterpretation. And um, of course, we need to avoid confrontational behavior. Um, because by staying calm and moving slowly, will encourage the student to mirror your behavior. Those mirror neurons, yeah, are always ready and they work very quickly. So human beings have a tendency to mirror each other's behavior. So if you manage to stay calm, your student will spontaneously, automatically, um, and uh, try to adjust, will try to adjust their behavior, okay? Just to mirror you. So moving slowly, not making big sudden movements um, can really help. Your positioning, where you stand in relation to the student can really matter as well. So if you stand in front of them, that can be quite confrontational. If you move to the side, that can be a lot less threatening. Okay, so um, these little things can make a big difference. Your facial expression, the tone of your voice, they're not listening to what you're saying. All, all they see is, is, is how you, basically your physicality, your physical being. So we need to be quite conscious of that. Or all they might see, you know, I'm not saying that they're not listening at all, but they will, less, they will, they will but less will go in than otherwise would, okay. And, and of course, I'm sure everybody does that already, you know, like practice empathy, listen, listen and acknowledge that feeling. That, that the emotion that they have, you know? Oh, I can, I can see you're upset or, um, yeah, uh -huh, this is quite frustrating, I understand. You know, so listening to what, you're, what they're saying and, and acknowledging what they're going through is important as, as well. And then um, of course they need to be given space, so do not touch them. And, uh, you know, they, they really need to just um, be left. Um, you know, and we can't raise our voice or crowd the student or say anything that's too complicated, you know, like two step, three step instructions. Um, just keep it simple and processable. Um, yes, and then, of course, the idea of changing the channel. So once they've calmed down a bit, uh, we can help them to negotiate these uh, negative feelings by changing the channel. And what we mean by that is um, the use of cognitive distraction techniques. Yeah, so when your brain is engaged in these cognitive distractions, the, 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 the negative thoughts will be basically disabled because your brain is focusing on something else. So, and we do that, we do that in everyday life. You know, when you want to go to bed and you want to fall asleep, but it's just not happening. So a lot of us opt to um, read a book instead, you know, just switching channel completely away from everyday thoughts into that space. This is what we need to help them with. So for example, one, one thing that you can do is you can get them to count all the green things in the room. Yeah, they're just using a different bandwidth for that. They're not focusing on the negative emotions, they're focusing on something very, very practical, like finding all the green things and 
and, and counting them, or count the trees that they see from the window, or say every second letter of the alphabet, or say the words to their favourite song. It, it depends on the level of the learner. It depends on the learn. It, it, you know, it depends on the level and and your knowledge of, of of the learner. But basically, working out a strategy with the learner together might might be really useful, and the learner will be able to use that um, elsewhere. Um, in other contexts and in other areas of their life. Okay, so you allow them to reset. You allow them to walk away from that negative emotion and focus on something else. You literally split the channel, switch the channel, and you can do that with language as well. Because language, if you do that in another language, in a foreign language, that can, you know, and, and you talk about emotions in a second language, which is neutral, which could be neutral to their traumatic experiences, you've switched the channel, you've introduced the distance. There's the distance between the traumatic events and um, the, the language that they're trying to, you know, process emotions in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Anne says that um, it, um, I encourage students to draw or scribble over jotters, helps them to relax. Absolutely, yes. So working on these techniques, whatever suits um, um, the learners, Okay, now I've got a question. Should we ignore students' negative behavior? So when somebody gets angry, somebody gets really, really, really quiet and withdrawn, really, really frustrated, should we just not acknowledge it? Where do you stand on that? do you feel? Um, I think you have to acknowledge it. I think otherwise people might feel they're looking visible, but I think where I have difficulty anyway is how you acknowledge it, because you could be aware that something's happening and you don't want to, you don't want to make the person, say, feel more awkward. So yeah. I think yes, but I don't know to what degree and how to do it, mm -hmm. per se. That's my struggle. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, it's a two-part answer, really, that you've given. <laughs> yes, I'm going to react to the first bit. And I do agree, yes, we should acknowledge the students' reactions, the students' negative behaviour, because not acknowledging it can be a further trigger. It can be just as, you know, like not responding can be just as confrontational as responding in a negative way, you know? Um, some some people um, have trauma experiences that have to do with neglect or inaction. So as you say, Paul, um, or Callum, sorry, Callum, uh, um, it, yes, it makes them invisible, feel invisible, and really don't want to, don't want that to, to, to happen. So basically um, what is recommended by researchers is the enforcing of limits of acceptable behavior, yeah? Um, they need to be given uh, the support to learn to regulate their behavior. So we need to enable them, in other words, first of all, to, to recognize their own feelings and to be able to talk about their own feelings. So talking about emotions in English in their language class can be a really, really important thing because it helps them on a different channel to process the language that is needed to process emotions. And it can start conversations um, that might be quite helpful with their peers or with you. You know, so when you learn about emotions, you can, you can ask the students, oh, okay, angry. When do you feel angry? What makes you angry? What makes you happy? What do you do when you're angry? What can you do if you don't like being angry? What can we do? not to feel angry. Oh, and you can share your, your strategies because we all have strategies, yeah, that we use when we get angry. What do you do? Hmm? And you can say, well, I look out the window and count all the green things. Well, my boss tells me something, <laughs> you know, I count all the cars in the street. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, um, it is really important to share our strategies with them as well. 
Um, yes, so the second language uh, can introduce an extra layer of safety there. Yeah, because they're, they're talking about emotions in a different language, not in the language that might hold different associations for them. Um, so this is called language switching. And there's an interesting article on this on um, ESOL, formerly ESOL Nexus, I think. I think that's where it was. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but if you put in language, uh, language switching, ESOL, ESOL Nexus, uh, Google will um, pull it up. Um, okay. Now, one thing that we can definitely do is um, engage in good old fashioned relationship building. And I know that you all do that, yes, but sometimes it's quite good to think through why it's so important. So basically forming positive relationships is the key element of success in the class um, with the students. It, it's all of you have the magic wand. You all have the power in your hand because what we do is we're basically reprogramming, we're, 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 we're shaping those neurological pathways, okay? Um, we have a tremendous opportunity because every interaction that we have with the students is basically an opportunity to heal. Um, so seven minutes of empathetic, empathetic connection, and this is you know, research, um, uh, seven minutes of empathetic connection can reshape and build new positive pathways in the brain. That's all that's needed for somebody to have a more positive outlook, outlook a more positive way of thinking and being. Um, and of course that is possible if we have unconditional positive regard for our learners. I, I know that some of you will be nodding, oh, good old Carl Rogers, you know, the humanistic um, educator, philosopher, slash researcher, psychologist. Yeah, but it's definitely, um, you know, all the compassion, compassionate teaching, all the compassion and empathy that you show your learners is part of their healing and has a very, very big place um, and, and part in, in their learning. So emphasizing and valuing learners' potential growth is also uh, a, an important aspect of our teaching. Um, when we're looking at missing skills as an opportunity rather than a deficit, okay? So this, we're looking for this relatedness to the teacher we're looking for the fear and suspicion to go away and, the, and, and that very important social emotional connection to the teacher and then of course to peers. So whenever you encourage group work, whenever you, you know, want to build that classroom com community, we do that because that's essential to their healing. So, do you recognize this? Ten points if you get where where it's from. Okay, I think Han, Han, Hannah, you're not on. Ian, Ian, I can't hear you. Is it Hedway? Oh, is no. it not the grammar book? What's his name? Raymond. Oh, it is. Yes, it's Murphy. Yeah. Murphy, that's the man. Absolutely, <laughs> our old favourite, Raymond Murphy. The red book. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and this is the unit on can. Okay. First activity, ask Steve if he can do these things. <laughs> Swimming, skiing, chess, running, driving, and horse riding. So, you know, just imagine your level two, three groups. Yeah, what, what would this, what would the message be here? What kind of message does this send to a, um, a young unaccompanied minor asylum seeker? It'd be quite bad for their self-esteem because there's maybe a lot of there that they can't do. Absolutely. You can do nothing. Mm -hmm. You can do nothing that Steve can do. Look at Steve. 
and look at you. You know, so the, the global textbook can be quite an intimidating mm -hmm. and well, and a heartbreaking experience, you know, for, um, for, for our students. Um, and we need to be really selective when we look at materials. Um, because it might, this activity might serve as evidence to the student that their abilities, in fact, are very limited. Um, and uh, as you say, it's, it's horrific for their self-esteem. And um, our, our goal um, should be to have a positive sense of self and build a positive sense of self or allow the student, enable the student to build a positive sense of self. So be really critical with whatever materials you use, especially be suspicious of the global textbook. Um, okay, I'm going to have to speed up here because I, I, I want to talk some more. I want you to talk as well. Um, so yeah, be careful with material selection. Um, we need to focus on strength-based approaches and um, we need to look at resilience building as not necessarily separate from language building, yeah, for language, improve, language improvement and language development. So we need to be on the lookout for language acqu acqu um, activities that build confidence and self-esteem. And uh, hopefully in the last few slides, I'll be able to show you a couple of examples. Um, also promoting a growth mindset in the classroom. Um, you know, your, your, um, your attitude to mistakes, for example, that makes mistakes are okay, mistakes are necessary. If you don't make a mistake, you're not learning. You're not learning anything new. You're not using language if you don't make a mistake. Mistakes are good, yes, mistakes are, mistakes are there because you're speaking and writing. How good is that? Um, mindfulness exercises, breathing exercises. This can be a really small investment, yeah? And at the beginning of the session, but it can have a significant impact on the students. Um, there are good uh, breathing exercises on Young Scott, the Young Scott website, quite simple. I'm dyspraxic, so I find it really, really difficult to explain what my body should do, <laughs> but I'm able to understand those exercises and able to follow them. So they must be good <laughs> because I can follow those instructions. Okay, but uh, basically these are examples of exercises that or, or tasks, activities that you can do with students to build resilience and to build um, and strengthen self-esteem. So you can do gratitude journals, yeah? And you can start small, like write three things that you are thankful for today, you know? And you can just do it as a warmer or a cooler or you know, in the middle to give them a wee break, yeah. Um, you can do a good news round. I stole this from Pauline. Uh, she used it at one of our meetings and I thought, oh, goody, yes, absolutely. What a lifter, what a lifter. I'm going to do that with my students. And it is wonderful because you can practice scale, yeah. So you can model it. You go in and say, okay, hello, everybody. I can see you're tired. I want everybody to give me one, one bit of good news, one good thing that, thing that happened to you. And if you say, well, my good news is that I thought I had no milk in the fridge, and then I found at the back of the fridge, I found a bit of fridge and I had my coffee, ho oh, ho, you know. So you give them a kind of a, an idea of, of, of what good, what positive news is. Um, and then they'll be, they'll be able to um, look for positive examples in their own lives as well. You're just reshaping those pathways. Yeah. Um, you can do achievements collage. This is a bigger project, but it's quite good because they can, they can talk about their journeys. They, they develop the language to think and process, you know, their experiences. You know, do a pictorial kind of guide for every student, if you have the time and opportunity, find pictures of the things that you're proud of, that you're happy about, you know? Um, what are the things that you achieved, that you made, that make you feel good? 
And then, of course, you can turn that into a presentation. They can talk about it. They can share with each other. They can write about it. So, but again, it encourages them to talk about or to think about their own experiences and their own journey in terms of positives. And of course, you are instrumental and their peers are instrumental in, in finding those positives. Because we tend to see each other in a positive light. Yeah, Peer, students, other students will see their peers in a positive light. But the student himself or herself will not see themselves as such. So peer help is, is, um, is instrumental. And I found that with the self-esteem bingo activity. This, I found that on my free bingo cards, I think Pauline will put the link in. And um, it, so you can adapt it. You'll need to adapt it because it's an American. This is already my adaptation for a level four class, but you can further you know, you can you can remove the number of um, the number of lines, so you can make it a three by three grid, which I'm going to do because I can use it as a warmer as well. Um, and you can of course change the language because uh, when I first used that, um, I had to teach them pre-teach words, you know, like compliment and admire and uh, applaud. But my goodness, as a group, it is absolutely wonderful. You know, um, we did it uh, for the first time. The first time I did it, it took a wee bit of time. So I had to pre-teach a lot of things, you know, like even bingo, some of them are not familiar with, but that's fine because the investment really paid off. Um, I did it, so I did it a number of times and I have been doing it with this class. And today we did it just for 15 minutes at the beginning of the class. So I just use it as a, as a warmer, as a lift, as a, you know, as a fun thing while we're waiting for others to arrive. What I do is I put them in pairs. I call the tile. So I say, I feel best when people, and then they cross it off. They find it on the grid, they cross it off, and then they talk to each other and they share the information with each other, you know, in pairs. And the, 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 the degree of support that they give each other in terms of digging out positive aspects of their experiences and their existence and their personalities is absolutely fantastic the way they support each other the way they um talk to each other um these are some of the things they said because today they clapped before you know when i said that we're going to play i, th I call it feel good bingo i don't call it self-esteem bingo i call it feel good bingo they clapped and i said oh you like this i said oh yes and at the end i asked them what they why why they liked it um and one, one of my students said, you build your happiness inside. Yeah, you build your happiness inside. So I'm going, I'm going to, I'm, if I ever have a tattoo, <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got nothing written on my body. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful way of, of, of understanding and processing this activity yeah because the feedback that I got from them was that um, um, we don't talk about feelings because these questions are hard because we never talk about these things they also said some people never say something positive about me yeah some someone said it is not a custom to say something nice about myself in my country yeah. Um, another person said, sometimes it is difficult to talk about yourself. So all these questions, all these statements, you know, these starter sentences aid them to do just that, to see themselves in a positive life, to talk about themselves in a positive light, and to, of course, massively reshape those neurological pathways or build them. Yeah. And then another thing that um, um, Pauline has put in the uh, uh, chat box is educational films for mental health, mental well-being. And that's really good because they're targeted at a refugee asylum seeking audience. So um, um, they're just coming out. It's some kind of a, you know, it's a campaign and they're going to, they, it should run from January to, uh, to April. And the first video will be a refugee 
uh, talking about um, seven tips on what we can do to help us stay mentally well. So it's a wonderful teaching opportunity and resource, you know, that you can adapt for your own purposes in the class. And we're, we're, we're so running out of time. So this is my feel good bingo. Excellence gateway. I don't know if you know the offender learning packs. Yeah, they're hidden. And uh, it's, they're quite difficult to find if you look in, ex in excellence gateway. So I really, you know, Pauline will put the thing in the box, in the chat box, the, um, the link. Now, they have specific chapters on mental health, talking about feelings. And the fantastic thing is that they're graded. They're graded from, you know, NAT two, three, four. Yeah. And um, so have a look because they're, they're great. And, and they, they specifically target mental health. And we're really running out of time. And I want to talk to you about self-care. And the irony is not lost upon me, right? It's three minutes to eight, and I'm preaching to you <laughs> about self-care, looking after yourself. But you're sitting here with me on a Monday night. Yes, yes. All of this, all of this caring, all of this empathy, and all of this compassion that you have takes a tremendous toll on you. Yeah, a, a tremendous toll on you. Um, and uh, we need to be careful, and we need to be vigilant, we need to be really self-aware, uh, because uh, secondary trauma vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, is, 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 is very much something that a lot of people working with trauma-impacted students and trauma-impacted people experience. If you catch it early, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really easily um, treated. So these are some of the signs to look out for, okay? Withdrawing from friends and family, feeling unexplainably irritable, angry or numb, blaming others, feeling hopeless or isolated or guilty about not doing enough, yeah, struggling to concentrate, being unable to sleep, overeating, not eating enough, continually and persistently worrying about students. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing this because I don't see your faces, but my, my oh, Right. <laughs> how do I, how do I, right, okay, this is, how do I unshare? It's too late. My brain said, oh, eight o'clock, switching off. <laughs> is it not un, un present or un? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. There okay. we go. Okay. Yeah. Have we, have I, am I still sharing? Have I stopped? You're still sharing. I'm still sharing. Goodness. Okay. I know we are close to the eight o'clock. We did start yeah. late. So if anybody has yeah. uh, any questions or anything that they would like to share, particularly any practice perhaps that they've um, tried in their classrooms that they'd like to share with the group, that would be really brilliant. Just unmute yourselves or stick your hand up while Orsi futters about and tries to unshare her, um, her presentation. I found it. Can you see yes. it? Even I can yes. see it, Orsi. No, 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 not you. Here no, no, no. My excuse is I'm working on two screens, eh? Yeah. And I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I did get there slowly, but I did. Excellent. So, can I yeah. open the floor to the team then, the team, the group? Does anybody have mm -hmm. any questions or comments for Orsi? All silent on the Western Thank front. you. That was very interesting. Good. Or you can tell me how you relax. How, you, how, how do you look after yourself? What do you do to make sure that you're okay? Because I think that's important. How do you make sure that you are not too impacted? Wine. <laughs> yes, I don't. I said okay. that in a work session for something else today and everyone else was giving really nice answers and I thought maybe I'll just give my true answer. So I put in wine and the amount of people afterwards went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just done the same there. No, seriously, on a serious note, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't condone it. However, <laughs> you know, what I mean? <laughs> let's let's find other ways. Oh. And I'd say that one of the challenges I've felt particularly is when dealing with um, heterogeneous 
ESOL classes mm. when I may have some students in there who have come from, uh, you know, who are refugees and asylum seekers, adults, and they've come from a lot of trauma and they may be sitting with students from di completely different backgrounds um, who have not experienced trauma and who may not be particularly sympathetic to yeah. asylum seekers and yes. refugees. And it's like on the one hand, you're trying to create a safe space mm -hmm. where people can share and be themselves. But on the other hand, sometimes it's not always a safe space because you can't control how other students may respond. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to create empathy and more understanding. But at the same time, you know, I can think of one occasion uh, with elementary students and one of my Arab students in the course of just talking and sharing said um, Allah Akbar and I had a whole group of students during the break who went to the supervisor to report them as terrorists mm. and wanted them reported to protect um, just because there was that mismatch of culture and misunderstanding you know and it was simply that you know a student was talking about his experience and just said you know God's great yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a challenge, you know, I found that to be sometimes a yeah. challenge. It's okay when you have one group of everybody coming from Syria or everybody coming from a certain background, but when they haven't and 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 other people in the class, you don't know how they necessarily respond. Yeah. Suzanne, yeah. how did you respond to that? How did you manage that, if you don't mind me asking? Or how was it managed within your team or within yeah. your department? Well, uh, to begin with, the, the people who were complaining uh, was a class representative. In our okay. college, we have class representative. Mm -hmm. So the class representative and another student came to see me immediately during the break. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I tried to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but they themselves, I wasn't sure to what extent, they were expressing their own personal views mm -hmm. or to what or extent someone. they were representing other people's views. Um, and that was kind of difficult to kind of find out straight away. But, you know, it was kind of um, clear that, uh, you know, there were some people in that class that had um, an attitude, a negative attitude towards immigrants and immigration per se. Mm -hmm. And and actually um, one one of the girls said to me, um, and again, it could have just been that she didn't have the language to express herself clearly, but she did say um, all, all Muslims are terrorists. Mm -hmm. So I had to, and her friend was sitting there and agreed. And so I had to talk her through that and say, you know, um, all, all Muslims are terrorists. Have you ever known a Muslim? And of course, she'd never met a Muslim before she'd come to class and before she had some people sitting with her. So it's, it was about really realising that part of my job was to do that sort of creating a safe place for people to see people as people, that it wouldn't necessarily happen overnight. And um, to try and explain a little bit that, you know, this was just a young man. He just arrived in the country. He was sharing his views give them a chance to get to know him. And I mean, we did have to report it to the supervisor and thank God at the time, it was someone who could contextualize it. And, you know, we obviously had to keep track on these, you know, young men who were being perceived as a big threat by some of the others in the class. But fortunately, it, 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 it took a period of time to establish relationships. And to try and break down, break down the suspicion, the paranoia, the fear, um, the, uh, and, and create more understanding. And part of that was group management, having a lot of group tasks. I didn't necessarily go for peer tasks. I went with group tasks, trying to and trying to encourage at the end of each task, you know, some self reflection, mm -hmm. and trying to create more seeing people as people mm -hmm. than, than beyond stereotypes um, yeah. yeah and so really it was an ongoing basis and it was <laughs> relationship building but frankly it was also about really indirectly challenging 
um, generalization stereotypes and prejudices. But, you know, at the same time, I had to recognize that these other group of students, they had never come across a Muslim before in their personal experience or an Arab before. And it kind of, you know, it kind of shocked me. Yeah. But their starting point seemed to be, and as I say, I may be misrepresenting them because their language wasn't so good, but it seemed to be Arabs equals Muslims equals terrorists. Yeah. And it was about breaking those equivalencies. I don't think you need to be an English language student to be making those silly connections. There's enough people trumping down the high street that would come out with the same kind of silly uh, um, statements. Uh, thank you. That's really interesting. Callum, you have your hand up. Have you got something you'd like to add? Um, just, I think, looking at the chat, someone had, was speaking about like ESOL literacy learners, how you maybe have those kind of conversations with people if you're trying to assist you know, be empathetic to concerns that they have. Just what I've found personally can be useful is that even where there's a language barrier, if you've got, if you can communicate, I know that might depend on your setup, but if you can communicate, say, on like WhatsApp with learners where, they, where they've got, say, literacy in Arabic, you can often quite have a, a rich exchange uh, that's quite deep and you can get, you know, you can get understanding, okay, what actually happened um, and find out from them like, what you know what was the problem and you can communicate using you know normal language and you can get some kind of understanding there where maybe if you're working with those near beginner learners that kind of conversation is a lot more challenging to have in the target language um i don't know if others have found that as well or Anybody else like to comment or add any thoughts? Thanks, Callum. I think everyone's yeah. like, come on, it's bedtime or wine o'clock. I can't decide. Yeah. One of the two. <laughs> um, I'd just like to extend a huge apology again for the issues about coming in this evening. I'd love to say I knew exactly why some people could get in on the link and some people couldn't. So I'm really thankful that some of you made it this evening so that's brilliant thank you so much for joining us tonight i am going to finish the session because we are over and i know that it's important that we finish as close to eight o'clock as possible um so thank you so much a huge thanks to orsi for giving up her time um and hopefully you'll join us for the next one which is in february so look out on the website for details for that coming up soon and i will triple check the zoom link for the february session everyone uh, thank you so much great to see you thank you so much for your input as well good night everybody thank you everyone thank, thank you. you thank you thank you also fantastic thank you i know thank you